Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, this is O'Culture, broadcasting esoteric art, science, and history at 528 hertz. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thank you for choosing to spend your time here with us. And thank you to all of our new subscribers out there across the United States, up into Canada, down into Paraguay, across the pond in the UK. Thank you to my Norwegian, Swedish, and Danish friends. Gracias a mis amigos en España. And good day to my mates down under as well. This episode, we're chatting with the wandering witch herself, Natalie Zaman. Natalie has recently published a book called Magical Destinations of the Northeast, a catalog of sacred sites, occult oddities, and magical monuments found throughout the northeastern part of the United States. We're going to be talking about that. We actually do one of my favorite things to do. We make a list of our top five sites from the book, including a site involving the alleged final resting place of one Aleister Crowley. We also talk a bit about witchcraft and how she got into that, and some general traveling habits that we have. Natalie is a ball of straight New Jersey fire. She was a bit under the weather when we spoke, but you wouldn't know it. She brought a ton of energy to this conversation, so let's get right to it. Here's my chat with the wandering witch, Natalie Zaman. Enjoy! Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, I really appreciate no your time. Oh, no, this is this is great. Thank you for having me. Let's start here. I saw this film, The Witch, last year. Did you see that? Yes, I love that film. <laughs> yeah, and I came out of the movie theater, and I, I told my friend who I saw it with, I said, damn, witches are sexy. <laughs> Although Does the witch like in that... like the taste of butter? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the witch in that movie is not sexy, and witches traditionally are not portrayed as sexy, but I think what I meant was witchcraft is sexy. Yeah. So don't ask me why I think that, because I don't know if I could explain it. But regardless, you're the first witch that I've interviewed, so I want to know, what's it like to be a witch, first of all, in 2017? You know, I think it's, it's different for everyone. I mean, for myself... I mean, by the way, just to like interject something because I'm <laughs> not 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 that I'm 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 old-ish, but like things, my mind, like the way it works nowadays is that if there's something in there, I better get it out now before I get into something else and then forget it. The sexy witch thing, one a book that you have to read that's coming out this coming August, I think, um, is Glamour Magic by Deborah Castellano. I got a preview of it and it's kind of right along those lines and it's right along the lines of the witch movie. It just, even the word glamour kind of gets you into that kind of like, and it's, it's, it's not all about, you know, being sexy or sex or anything like that, but there's an aspect of glamour and that also comes into play in the movie. I don't know if that was something that you kind of noticed. I think Um, I maybe, I don't know if I consciously picked up on it, but I think that may have been subconsciously what propelled my comment to my friend, you know, because I I had this this, this weird feeling when I watched that movie where I was like, man, this is a really sexy film. Yeah, I mean, because you know what it is? It's just so, I don't want to use the word forbidden, but that just sometimes comes to mind. But it's like these things that maybe they really shouldn't be forbidden. Like at the very end, like I, like I was saying, I, that's like one of my favorite lines from movies. Like, does thou like the taste of butter? You know, that, that pretty yeah. dress. And it's like, yes, I love butter and pretty dresses and all those kind of things. And I don't know if this is like a, like an American thing from like a Puritan standpoint, but it's like, those are the things you shouldn't want, but come on, we all want them, you know? Well, um, I stopped eating butter like two years ago, but I get your point. Yeah, yeah. What's your butter? You have a butter somewhere. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what it would be. Or your your pretty dress. What is it? I mean, like everybody has their thing they want, and the thing is, when when it comes to glamour, um, and I'm I'm readers digesting this um, immensely here, but it's just like. What are you willing to do? Sometimes there's things that you're willing to do to get what you want. And that in and of itself is sexy because you'd have to, you know what I mean? It's like you have to have that that freedom and confidence, but also the knowledge that there's no free lunch. Everything comes with a price and you're willing to pay it. So, I mean, that's the kind of thing that, I mean, that, that kind of ties into that whole thing. But anyway, what's it like to be a, a, a witch in 2017? So... For me, personally, it's a lot of freedom. But then again, I mean, when you're talking about, like, I guess, like, the 
so I don't like typing things, but like the type of, of, of which that I am. I mean, I, I really don't advertise. I don't know if that makes any sense. I mean, I, I don't deny anything, but I, I don't, you know, it's not something that I, you know, that I bring up or talk about, but if it comes up in conversation, then yeah. To me, it means freedom, freedom to believe and see things, you know, and to kind of not deny just like that, you know, that whole kind of theme in the witch film. It's like the freedom to go after the the things that you want, but knowing that, like I said, there's no free lunch and you have to decide that case by case. So and, and personally, I've not had any kind of stigmas thrown at that at me, like people looking at me askance and, and stuff like that. But who knows? you know, that that very well may come or either that or I just haven't really been aware of it or it doesn't bother me if it if it has. So right, right. So how yeah. did you become a witch then? When did the interest in witchcraft or the occult in general start? Okay, so I was I was raised Catholic. Um, I went to Catholic school pretty much almost all of my schooling years, including college. And in fifth grade, I had a teacher named Sister Natalie. Ha ha, yes. There, there's so many Natalies in my life. I, my agent is Natalie. There was Sister Natalie. And one of the things that, that she would do um, as part of our like classroom activity is we had like time where we would be, where we would read, but she would read to us. So it was like maybe at the end of every day, she would take like the last half hour and read, uh, you know, various books. And the the three that I remember, and I, maybe it was only three throughout the course of the year, because, you know, the last 30 minutes of the day, um, she read The Phantom Tollbooth, she read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and she read this book by E. L. Conisberg called uh, Jennifer Hecate, uh, Macbeth, William McKinley, and Me, Elizabeth. All of them have a kind of magical aspect to them, as far as, as kids' books go. But in E. L. Conisberg's book, it was... It's this without giving too much away because it's a short read and it's and it's good. And it's also very much of the time because it was written in the early 60s, I believe. And I was in fifth grade in, ooh, 1980 something without giving too much away. <laughs> so, I mean, it was an older book at the time, but it was, you know, it, it was still like very much. I think you probably go into school libraries and see it. But it's about a girl who encounters a witch in everyday life. Now... Just, you know, how witchy is it that you'd have to read the book for because I don't want to give too, you know, give too much away. But I remember listening to that story and being fascinated because this was not a fantasy, which this was just a kid going to school every day. You know, the, they were in a school play. It was like it was things that that I was experiencing every day. And it's like, oh, here's this here's this witch. And the, and, and the witch she encounters is a, is a girl her own age. So then I ended up going to the library and looking up all like the, you know, the witchy dictionaries and there were not the resources that there are today where there's, there's lots of books on, on, uh, you know, how to like Wicca for the solitary pr practitioner. And by the way, I want to kind of, and, and I'm, I'm rambling here. <laughs> I'm no, sorry. It's, it's, it's great. Keep going. <laughs> all right. Um, there's a, there's a, not a difference, but when you say Wicca and witch, they're different. Wicca is a religion. And there is, even though there, there are many solitary practitioners, there's, there's, a, there's a structure and a discipline to it. I can't, in all honesty, call myself Wiccan, just the same way as like, I probably can no longer call myself Catholic, although I've studied both. The word witch is a, like a much broader term, if you know what I mean. Um, I think it encompasses a lot more or a lot of different things. But there's yeah, there's definitely a difference between between Wiccan and Wiccan. Anyway, there just wasn't the resources back then that there were. I mean, like you could go to a dictionary and, and, and or a, an encyclopedia and you could look up like witch hunts in Salem. And I mean, that was pretty much it until later, probably when I was a teenager. Um, and then then you'd started getting like, you know, books like uh I'm trying to think of what, what were some of the first ones I got. Um, Magical Rites from the Crystal Well was one. Another one called Good Magic, which I still have, was another. And now there's just there's there's so much information everywhere. You don't even have to, to go and buy books. There's just everything is all over the place on the Internet. You brought up the Salem Witch Trials just now. I'm curious. I've read a lot of conflicting stories about whether these, these trials actually existed. Am I... Ooh. Have you not heard this before? No, I actually, I haven't. I mean, to me, you know, I know that, you mean like whether they they even like took place, like whether like these people were actually 
um, you know, like Rebecca Nurse and all those people, like not whether they actually existed, but whether this actually happened or not. Yeah. Is, is that what you're yeah. saying? Uh, no, I have not come across that. But that doesn't mean that it isn't so. If there's one thing I've, I've learned from writing Magical Destinations of the Northeast is that history is kind of a fluid and relative thing and that, you know, new evidence for all different kinds of theories and all different kinds of theories pop up all over the place. And what you need to do is just if you if you come across something like that and it interests you is investigate, 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 look at your sources and stuff like that. Now I'm interested. Where did you see this? Because I'm, oh, I'm looking it up as soon as we're shit. done. Here. Yeah, I mean, you know, I <laughs> wish I would have bookmarked it or something. But and it wasn't it wasn't in preparation for this conversation. It was just yeah. something I came across several months ago. And I don't know, it was a passing mention, maybe on another podcast, maybe on something I was reading on the Internet. And I mean, I was interested in researching it further, but I never did. So hmm. I can't tell you. I might, I might even be making it up for all I know. I, I might have just had a dream where it, where it just happened that way. <laughs> oh, but, ooh, could this be anything to do with, oh, what was it that I just heard? And I heard it. I didn't look it up. I just heard it, and I can't even tell you who I heard it from. It was like a conversation in passing that the whole thing, like, you know how, like, with the, the crucible relates to McCarthyism and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. Okay. I just heard, listen to this, it's like a goth obsession. I just heard (laughs) that, like, I guess, like, you know how they release documents, like, after, like, government documents after a certain period of time? Sure. Um, All right. So apparently documents were just released that proved that McCarthy was right. Really? Yeah. And I remember I heard that. So don't hold me to it. I'm not saying it. I'm stating I'm not stating it as a fact by any stretch of the imagination. But the thing is, I, you know, there are things that I I found, like I said, we we talk about things that are happening uh, in the world. And then decades later, more information comes out. I think it's going to be interesting to see in 50, 60 years what comes out about 2017. Uh, you know, quote, the truth of the matter. Because in, it's, it's very interesting. My, my mother, this is like kind of a kind of a side note, but just to kind of illustrate that, right? My mom and dad and my grandparents um, on my dad's side worked for the United Fruit Company, which was a kind of import company that brought in (laughs) fruit (laughs) from like South America, Dominican Republic, Cuba, that kind of thing. And it came out that the United Fruit Company was a front for the CIA because they had been spying on Cuba for decades. And what? Yeah. And I told my mom this and she was like, yeah, there was this guy at the office and he was like in the Spanish department and they would bring him into the and they talked to him for hours and we'd be wondering what they were talking to him about. So, yeah. <laughs> well, that's funny, too, because we hear all these stories about how companies are fronts for operations and things like that. And there's so many of them that you really don't know which ones are true or not. But I guess firsthand experience trumps all of it, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> no so pun that's, intended. that's interesting. Are you working for the CIA right now? Possibly. Can't Possibly? tell you. Okay. okay. <laughs> Ooh, who knew that this interview would turn into a taut political discussion? <laughs> that's something. Yeah, no. That's, I that's, don't that's, want that's, it that's... to. No, no. I want to talk about <laughs> magical destinations of the Northeast and some other related things. So sure. let's just transition into that before we get too far off the rails, if you don't mind. Okay. So this is a great idea for a book. I personally love traveling, and this is the kind of travel companion that I'd love to travel with. And I've always found myself drawn to the sorts of places that you have in this book, to these mysterious, magical places. And to this point in my life, I never knew why I liked to visit these sorts of places until I got to know myself and realized that I was quite empathic. I know that's not unique to me, but that's a recent discovery the last couple years of my life about myself. I think we all have that sort of ability, right? Agreed. Yes, very yeah, much so. So. It, so it wasn't that these places were necessarily mysterious. It was just that I felt connected to them and didn't know why. So, you know, maybe that's the mystery. Why did I feel so connected to places I'd never been before? Or why did I seek these places out when I was traveling? Why did they call me to visit them? So did you feel the same way at some point in your life? Did you feel connected to places that you'd never been? Oh, Sure. Absolutely. You know, I didn't get to go many places as a child. Um, You know, it wasn't until I was 
like a, I guess like a teenager. I went, when I went to California when I was, when I was like 17 or something like that, but it wasn't, that was like my like first like big trip ever. And it wasn't until like later, like after college that I actually got to go like abroad and stuff. But like, I, I always felt a connection to England. Always, always, always. I didn't know anyone there at at the time. Yeah. I always felt a connection there. And it was like, it was later in life and afterwards and even now and I'm I'm 47 now and it wasn't even until last year that I found out like the connections that my family had there like I didn't know I didn't know a lot about my dad's side of the family until probably early uh last until early last year when I did like the whole DNA and um you know ancestry thing and it I have roots there that go way way back I've also like there are certain places where and you'll know it and I think uh, and I think a lot of people feel this way it's like whether you plan it or not or whether like initially you're drawn to a place or or not when you get there you feel like like you've come home in a way you know it's like you feel incredibly comfortable you feel like you've you know maybe you feel like you've been there before but there's just something about the atmosphere or whatever that like just makes you feel at ease with yourself and comfortable and there have been several places where i felt that way i felt that way in like different parts of england like providence rhode island i i just i felt so at home there new orleans i felt at home there new york city but then that's been a part big part of my life now anyway um because i have you know, family and, and grew up uh, going back and forth there. So, but yeah, I, and I think that's true for everybody. I, you know, you just have to be open to it, which is also something what we were talking about before with, you know, with, with a witch and what it, what it means. It's, it's like, that's, it's that freedom to be open to these things, to let it in. Yeah. Was that feeling you got in your youth? Is that what kind of compelled you to pursue witchcraft? Like I said, the the one I you know it's it's I'm trying to think back because remember that was a long time ago, darling. Right, right. <laughs> you know, um, but I mean it. I, you know, to think back to that moment, I like I said, the thing that 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 gets me is that story, and I listen to that and I think about that story and I and I got myself uh and you know an ancient battered copy on eBay of E. L. Conis- Konigsberg's book. And I read it now and I could still hear Sister Natalie reading like different passages and I still like the hair on my arm still goes up when I get to certain passages because it's just like, yes, that was the moment, you know, and it's funny that it started with a story because that was really my first, you know, my first real travels, because like I said, I didn't really do much of that when I was a kid, even though, you know, I, I, you know, everything was an adventure, even like going into the woods behind my house. You know, Uh, so it was just, yeah, that was like my some of the best adventures I had as a kid was going into the woods behind the house, you know, (laughs) all sorts of good stuff there. Well, you know, because you just let your imagination take over when you're back in those environments and it just it's so much more enjoyable. I, I would hate to grow up now. So where did the idea to catalog these magical destinations in the Northeast come from? My family and I, in 2013, one of the things that I've always wanted to do was do a cross-country road trip. And in 2013, I got my wish. And we rented a van, and we drove to to San Francisco, then down the California coast, then back up through the southwest and, and whatnot. And on our way out there, out west... You know, we, we, we went and, you know, you, you, you make this, me make the stops. One of the places we went to was Mount Rushmore. And then my husband wanted to go to Devil's Tower. And I was like, oh, okay. I mean, it wasn't something that I particularly wanted to do, but it was something he wanted to see and it was on the way. So it was just like, oh, okay. Yeah, no, we're going to stop there. So we go to Mount Rushmore first. And, you know, it's, I guess like if you're, if you get close up to it, it's more breathtaking, but if you're standing on the platform with like all of it and it's very built up too. So like if you ever get out there and you drive up there, um, once you start like kind of going up the mountain, it's very built up with like touristy stuff and everything. And then when you actually get there, there's a big parking lot and, you know, and, and a big, um, like, you know, gift shop and welcome center and all this other kind of stuff. And then you got on this platform and then you see the faces of the, of the presidents and whatnot. And I gotta say, I mean, when I was out there, I was a little underwhelmed. It was it was interesting, but it was just like, okay, you know, we we went and saw Mount Rushmore, and then after that, we went to Devil's Tower. And I remember driving, and it's it's like all planes and everything, and then this thing kind of rises up out of the out of nowhere, like a big tree stump, right? And we get there, and now this is a national park, mind you, and it's 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 June, school is out, beautiful day, summer's day. 
And we were the only ones there. And it was just incredible to me that we get out of the car where Mount Rushmore was so packed full of people. And this place, there was nobody there. So we, you know, get out of the car and we go to walk around the mountain because you can't, you know, there's like a path that kind of runs around it. And it was probably one of the most profound experiences I've ever had. It was so quiet. I mean, for me, I'm, I'm from New Jersey. There's never a time when there's not noise happening. Like you step outside and you'll hear a car, a car going by, a plane overhead. There's something. You, you always hear something. And I couldn't, there was nothing except like birds, maybe. And that's, that's so, that was just so incredible to me. I know it seems like such a small thing, but like it's, you know, when you're used to one way of, of thing, of living, and then you step into this other, it's just like, oh, you know, so the silence was just really profound. And then we walked around, as we walked around the mountain, they must have done some sort of burn off. So all the, um, like, I guess like you could smell like cedar and flowers. It was just, it was like being in a temple. You know, and it was it was wonderful that we were the only ones there to experience that, because that's that's something that if you can get to a place and try to be there alone um, or as alone as you can be, um, you really can connect to it better than if there are a million people around. But I thought to myself after we left, I was like, I don't want this to go away. And there are some places where if people don't go, then they will go away, if that makes sense. Definitely. And the interesting component to that is. What the hell is our cultural problem when a place like Mount Rushmore, which is really just celebrating a bunch of old men we've never met and we'll never know, and really, why do we care about them anymore? Maybe I'm jaded or cynical, (laughs) but I would much rather go to the place like Devil's Tower. I think anyone who's ever traveled with me personally, if they listen to this, will know that when we plan to go somewhere... My itinerary is not your average tourist itinerary, you know? Yeah. If I'm going to Washington, D.C., yeah. I don't want to walk the National Mall, really. Oh, yeah. I no, mean, no. I mean, I've done it. The, the first time I went there, I did it. But it's not like the places, those aren't the places that really call to me. And I don't know. Do you feel the same way? Yeah. I mean, like, there's there's definitely, I mean, like, there's the, that's the, the tourist sites. They're the places that, like, that, I mean, the National Mall has, I mean, there's there's things on it that are definitely worth seeing. There's little like secret pockets, but you know, you'll have like most folks flocking to the big monuments and, and whatnot. And it's, and it's the basic stuff and it has its importance, but there are so many. And that was the other, that was the other component of like, why catalog this? I feel, and I know things are like kind of traumatic and full of turmoil at the moment, but we are so underappreciated as a, as a country and as a people, there's so many things about America that are wonderful. I mean, people go, especially when it's um, in terms of like spiritual places and sacred sites and whatnot, people feel the need that they have to go abroad or to like, you know, or to like say ancient Greece or Rome or Stonehenge or something like that. And we have so much of that here that, you know, it's like discover this, you know, these things exist and look at us. And I have to say too, I mean, like when we made that trip, we encountered so many amazing people. Okay. Maybe I got lucky. I I know that there's always folks that aren't so nice or whatever, but on that trip, we didn't meet them. Everyone was, was super great. And we, I mean, and we had like a, an incident where things could have gone very badly. When we were coming home, we broke down on the, in the Texas panhandle on the 4th of July, at like two or three o'clock in the afternoon. And I can't tell you how many people stopped. Do you need water? Do you want us to wait with you while, you know, your replacement car gets here? Do you need a ride? Do you need anything? There's no need for us to be great again. We already are great. And, you know, that's as far as I, you know, as far as I go with, with, with that. That's just political marketing. That's not yeah. really anything substantial there. But I agree with you. People are so isolated these days. At least it feels that way to me. But mm. I always go out of my way to introduce myself to people. I've been that person that stopped on the highway. I've been that person that's walked over to a homeless guy and, and given him some money or some food. And it's just like I don't do it for any other reason than I want people to know that there are still good people left. Yes, absolutely. And I think that there are, that is the majority. I I, I honestly firmly believe that. And I'm, I'm hoping that everything, that if things will work themselves out 
and and whatnot, and I and I and I honestly believe that that's that that that's the case, and that that's what that is what is going to happen, you know, or that's my story, and I'm sticking to it because that's what gets me through the day, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but yeah, that was again, like I said, uh, when it comes to like these these sacred sites and cataloging them, and you know, and and ex- and exploring and that kind of thing, yeah, there's there's so many hidden pockets. There's the basic stuff, but go beyond that. Always go beyond that. I met a friend in Phoenix, gosh, about a year and a half ago, and I'd never been to Phoenix to stay. I've flown in there and flown out of there, but I've I've never actually stayed for more than a day. And, you know, Phoenix isn't necessarily a a touristy area, but I didn't want to do anything that involved being around a bunch of people. You know what I mean? Right, right. I hiked in the desert for like two days straight, and I was (laughs) completely okay with that. There was nobody around, and... That to me is traveling. That to me is experiencing the landscape that you're part of while you're in an area that you're unfamiliar with. That to me is is the the best part about being able to leave where you live and get out and experience a new place is to really experience it. So when I read your book, I was I very much felt like I was traveling along with you. The the way that you wrote it, your prose is gorgeous. The way that you laid the book out too, maybe you could tell people so you, you pick out, was it 13 states plus D.C. or 12 states plus D.C., and you break down each location in a specific manner. Could you maybe walk people through what the, the chapter looks like as you're going through this book? Sure, sure. And, you know, it's funny because the other thing is that was, like, developed over time. It, this certainly isn't what it was when I proposed it, which is it's interesting in and of itself. And, you know, it was originally going to be one book with all 50 states. And only two sites per state. And then, you know, we would have uh, the the emblems and things. But as time went on and I did edits and stuff, we added more information and more material. And, you know, how about this? And, and how about put more museums? And how about put more cemeteries and all this other kind of stuff? And then it just kind of morphed into this. So for each chapter, yeah, there's a little bit of an introduction, you know, like maybe a paragraph, just like about the state, just to kind of get you into what it's all about, if you could condense it into like a, you know, like a couple of lines. And then from there, um, there's a subheader for enchanting emblems. So that goes into the esoteric properties of the state flower and the state tree and the state stone or gem if it has one. And then after that, there's some bewitching tidbits, which is folklore. And by the all of these things, there are also like different places that you can go see in between. Like um, there are some places where like, say, for the state stone, there are places where you can go and like mine your own of that stone, which is kind of cool. Or a specific state forest where you could see the tree um, or a garden where you could see that flower. And then there's like things, if there's things that are close by, there's like these little subheaders called maps of more magic. And, you know, there's just any, anything like that's, that's close by or whatever that I could squeeze in. It's like, here, go here and go here and go here. It's like, you know, kind of being all excited about it and whatnot. So Bewitching Tidbits is different, like little bits of folklore and, you know, famous, maybe some, some famous people who lived in the area where they, where they lived, what, you know, what they did there. And then um, after that is magical monuments. A lot of those are cemeteries, but they could also be, you know, memorials and monuments in towns and, you know, or just randomly. And then after that is the actual sacred sites, you know, different places that you can visit. And then the chapter rounds out with a section called Stop By for a Spell. And that one was really important to me. Um, And even in the like abbreviated version of the book, I wanted that in there. And what that is, it's a, a contribution from someone from that state, because I felt that even if I went to a place myself and I loved it, there's nothing like the voice of someone who's lived there or who was born there or who was, who's been a part of that, that place for so long. And, uh, you know, I thought, you know, if, if, if we're doing a travel book, you need the voice, you need an authentic voice like that. So I'm really, really grateful that those folks who did contribute did so. And and they did so graciously and and wonderfully. And, And I got a nice variety of, you know, spells and rituals and memories and things. And I was so glad I was able to curate that. Yeah, I thought that was a nice little touch, too, to be honest. It's a good thing to have, I think, if you ever get to these states, to these places, that you could inject some of that local magical flavor into your trip. Oh, yeah. So let's go through, if you don't mind, some of the locations in the book. I have 
some notes here about places that stood out to me. Okay. And then maybe we'll recap at the end with like a top five or whatever. Okay. <laughs> but let's let's start, and I, I'm going to just go chronologically through the book. You start in yeah. Washington, D.C. You know, we talked about the National Mall and some of these monuments and museums and stuff. They are in the book, but what's one or two places in D.C. that stood out to you that people may not know about that they have to get to? On my last trip out there, one of the things that I, I really, really loved was the Museum of the American Indian. And... You know, I mean, there's it's one of the Smithsonian and you can go inside, but it's the outside that really like kind of dazzled me because what's going on outside is just as important as what's going on inside. There are like little nooks and crannies like there's a medicine wheel in an alcove outside where you can kind of just sit and, and meditate and it's like, you know, because when folks go, it's like they'll go into the museum and you, and you never even see like, like they think it's like it's like part of the architecture of the outside. Like there's a waterfall, but that waterfall, if you stand in a certain area, you can hear the echo of the water. There's million year old grandfather stones at every cardinal point outside. There's a moon phase calendar on I forget which entrance. There's like there's one there's there's a couple different entrances, but in front of one of them is a moon phase calendar that's embedded into the sidewalk. You know, so it's like be aware of your surroundings and, and you know, like the outside architecture is, is sometimes just as important and just as impressive as the inside. So do go there. And just as an aside, when you go in, have lunch there because their restaurant is just amazing. They had, um, I guess, like different Native American dishes from different parts of the United States. Um, so they have like a Southwest area and then they have like a, you know, a Northwest area with all different kinds of food. And it was just really, really awesome. I love food. Food is awesome. <laughs> Magical experience completely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I totally agree. I, I've always <laughs> loved to eat. So that's, to be honest, that's one of the top, maybe the top thing about traveling for me is to eat local, you know, just kind of inject that, you know, like I said, with the spell to inject the magical flavor of the location into your journey. But the more cultural piece is, you know, like, especially if you go to someplace like the Southwest or the Northeast, where they have very distinct cuisines, you know, is to eat like people eat there. I don't want to go to an Applebee's yep. in Delaware <laughs> or in Maine or wherever else. Like, that's there's no point to that. And yes, I do know people who do that. Uh, my mom and dad, by the way. But <laughs> it's just like, I, just, I don't get the point of that. And <laughs> you know, like if you go to D.C., why are you not going to Ben's Chili? Uh, I don't know if people know this place, but that's like one of the places to eat in D.C. That's a tangent. But I get very passionate about food when I'm traveling and I will argue with people. No, we're going to this place. We're, we're, oh, we're, not, yeah. we're, we're not going to this other place. We have to go to this place. No, I hear you. Julian's in Providence. <laughs> hey, <laughs> that see, there you go. You know, one thing that stood out to me in D.C. as I was reading through your book was the George Washington statue in the Smithsonian that apparently holds a pose similar to the pose of Baphomet. Yep. What's that about? You know, who even knows? You, you First of all, you figure, and again, my research and my and, and the book, you know, and, it, and it's pretty obvious once you get started on it, these are tidbits. There's, I'm sure that someone somewhere wrote an academic paper or a book on the uh, connection between the occult and possibly the Freemasons and, and our, you know, country's leadership and all that other kind of stuff. These are the tidbits that kind of whet your appetite. And it's like, ooh, what is that about? Again, what I was saying before is that if there's anything I learned from writing this is that history and the real reasons behind things may be unknowable. All we can do is piece things together. And just from looking at, you know, just from what I've seen, it's like, well, you know, we're talking ancient wisdom. We're talking that Washington was, he was a Freemason. Could there be a connection there? I know that there's books out there that do touch on that. So how about... Maryland. One of the things that struck me about Maryland was the evidence of hoodoo up in this part of the country, because normally that's something I think you see a little further down south, but you saw some evidence of hoodoo in Maryland. Did that strike you as odd? Yes and no, because remember, Maryland is still technically the south. You know, the Mason-Dixon line. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's there. But even so, and I'm, I'd be surprised if you didn't find the stuff up north, too, because at some point, 
everyone up here owned, owned slaves. They just they just did. You know, it wasn't like the North was like this pristine area where there were no there was no there were no black servants or or whatnot. They did own them. And these folks were part of the household and they incorporated their beliefs into it. I mean, that's where things were found, like under the floorboards. Uh, what do you call it? They uh, found like markings. And all of this was done, by the way, when or they discovered these when they were doing restoration work on some of these older homes. And this is just like I wonder if it's like just the tip of the iceberg, because what you know, what else could be found? I mean, I think they found like one bundle under a sidewalk near the uh oh, what do you call it near the uh the the docks and stuff like that you know so that could have been a travel protection thing and who knows again it's one of those things where it's like here's the evidence we obviously dug it up something was going on here but what exactly and i don't know if we're going to know the answers but the idea that 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 kind of magic has been going on you know it, it, it not really surprising but like that it's coming out and that it had to be hidden is also an interesting thing to note for sure. What else in Maryland stood out? Do you think? So one of my one of my favorite places that I ended up going was this was the cave, the Crystal Grotto's Caverns, which is like out like towards the western border of Maryland, and it's actually near Antietam. I know a lot of folks go to Gettysburg, but I found that Antietam is a little more. Again, it's not as built up as Gettysburg. And I'm, I'm not dissing Gettys, Gettysburg because it's an important spot. And it's, you know, for sure, there's a lot of activity going on there. And I mean, like spiritual activity and, and whatnot. But Antietam is is special, too, in its own way. It's in a quieter way. But I'll get to that in a second. So the Crystal Grotto's Cavern, we went out there. And I, I went in, like, I guess, like late December, early January in there somewhere. And uh, it was a time that where it wasn't crowded and that if, if I had to give one travel tip to people, it would be like go in the off season, go to these places in the off season when it's not crowded. It's definitely a, a different experience. There's a different kind of energy there. But like you can I think I, I personally connect to a place better when there's less people around. So anyway, we go to this cave and it's a show cave, which means, you know, that you could go, that it's, you know, not like something where you have to go spelunking and whatnot. You could go through and, you know, walk, walk through. And, and when you go in at first, it's very kitschy. You know, it has like, you know, the open sign and lights and that kind of thing. But when we went there, it was just myself and my husband and there was nobody else because, you know, it was the off season. So when we got to go down into this cave, it was just the two of us and the guide. And, you know, we're walking through and I thought like I wanted to include a cave or a cave or two in the book because, you know, it's it's, it's underground, you know, underground places are magical, you know, in terms of mythology, the Fae live underground and you've got gnomes and dwarves and all that other kind of stuff. And I thought that would be pretty cool. So we go into this cave and we're walking around and, and it is, I mean, like they talk about all the scientific part of it, like the deposits and it's all glittery and whatnot. And then the guy turns to us and he says, hey, do you want to see total darkness? And I, I didn't even think about it. I, I, cause if I thought about it, I would have been like, well, I don't know. And I was like, yes, yes, yes. Turn out the lights. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. That was, that was crazy. And I was like, but then I was like, but you have to promise to turn them back on. And he was like, oh yeah, sure. Whatever. And then all of a sudden all the lights went out and I, I'm going to, I'm going to take it for granted that you've read the Hobbit. Yes. You've oh, read yeah, the Hobbit. for sure. Everybody's yeah. read the Hobbit, right? Okay, so you know in the part where, like, Bilbo, like, wakes up in the in Gollum's cave, and it was like, you know, Tolkien's like, it was so black you could flap your hands in front of your face and you would never see anything. And that's, I have never been in, I mean, you could lock yourself in a closet and close your eyes and whatnot. You will still see some sort of light. There's nothing like this darkness. And I freaked out a little bit because I was just like, shit, it's so dark. You know, it's 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 so, so very dark. And then when I started to calm down, you know, and you start listening to things and there was like the drip of water and it was very calming. I have to say it was it was just, it was such an interesting experience because I'd never been in that kind of environment before. And then what was cool was like he had like one of those like miners hats on. So he turned the light on. It was just like this one beam of light. Kind of like a horror movie because, like, you figure the light's going to illuminate some creature or some something um, that didn't happen. But uh, it was just, it was, it was just an amazing experience and one I didn't expect. And I think that's something that you kind of, you kind of have to go in whenever you go somewhere. It's like you go with this open mind because you go for a purpose. Sometimes we go someplace with a purpose, but be open to the anti-purposes, the other purposes, the ones that you didn't plan. 
Right. You know. I didn't make any notes for Delaware. So oh so, sorry, sorry, Delawareans or whatever you would call them. But I just wasn't, I, there was nothing in there that spoke to me. Was there something that spoke to you though? Oh my gosh. So yeah, no, D- Delaware is a tiny little state, but it, it has like lots and lots of stuff. Two places that there were others, obviously. Okay. But two places definitely that you'd want to, that the, that first of all, anybody could go to any, well, almost any time is the Delaware Art Museum. Um, especially if you like pre-Raphaelite art, it's the largest collection of pre-Raphaelite art in the United States. And it's, it's just, in, it's in incredible paintings and, and, and it's a little hole in the wall. It's, it's in a, like almost in a neighborhood when you go there, that's how kind of tucked away it is. And I mean, they have regular museum hours and, and then that kind of thing. But I just, I remember going there and I just, I, I really like pre-Raphaelite art. So I just kind of, you know, loved wandering around in those rooms. Um, they're just, you know, fantastic. And then there's the new Alexandrian library, which is a library of occult books and alternative religions, which is, you know, and it's, it, it's new and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's still in its developmental stages. They're still like making collections and whatnot, but in it's, it's, I think their, um, their eventual goal is to be a lending library. But if you, especially if you have a scholarly interest, that's going to be like the central place that, you know, for resources for this, for, for written resources. And they have artifacts and art as well. So yeah, you know, Delaware has all sorts I, of cool stuff. I lied to you. You did. I did, oh, I, no. did I did have the new Alexandrian <laughs> library on my list, but I didn't put that it was in Delaware. I just have it kind of off on its own. I forgot to mark it. So I take back what I said about Delaware. I do want to go to the new Alexandrian library. <laughs> yeah. That did speak to me. Okay. Um, because, just because I think was it it's not modeled after the library of of Alexandria, is it? You mean like in, in, in shape and whatnot? I mean, like, I think that the concept is. Yeah. The concept yeah. is, definitely. I mean, and the building is cited in a very sacred way as well, as as are all of the, the structures and things at, at Sealy Court. It's a, it's a marvelous place when they do, you know, public events and stuff. I would definitely make it a point to go there. But the, the library itself is just, it's, it's an amazing place. And sometimes you wonder if, if there are that many books, and there are. And there are, and they're still like, you know, adding to the collections and, and it's, it's going to be an ongoing project. All right. So (laughs) moving then to Pennsylvania, one of the things that called to me, now I live in Ohio, I've traveled to Pennsylvania, gosh, I don't don't know how many times. So I'm very familiar with the bigger cities, uh, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. But one thing that stood out to me in Philly that I've not been to was this cave of Kelpius. Who is Johannes Kelpius and why is this cave so magical? Okay, so the the cave itself is in a park, okay? And it is, and as I'm talking to you, I'm flipping through. And look, I happen to mark the page. Isn't that weird? <laughs> oh, dear. Okay, so the cave itself, and I'm putting cave in quotes. People aren't sure if it's really a cave. Is it a pump house? What is it? But um, the, uh, I believe it was the Rosicrucian, the AMORC, has a little plaque outside uh, saying that this was the location where this guy, Johannes Kelpies, kind of set up shop. And he was, for all intents and purposes, uh, a mystic. And he had had his followers. They were, they were also like, people would come to them for healing advice, that kind of, that kind of thing. And then you have uh, the, the order that came after, which was, oh goodness. And now it's, it's escaping me and it's in the book and it's the, oh, it's, it's in Pennsylvania. And I hate when this happens. Sometimes I just like, it's not that I forget. It's just, that's why I said, remember I told you it leaves my head. Yeah. Oh yeah. (laughs) You know, there's the, um, there's a, like a kind of a monastery. It's now defunct outside of Philadelphia uh, that branched out from there, but it was it, it very very monastic and mystical and and whatnot. But supposedly this was the site where he set up shop. Now, is it really where he set up shop? I couldn't tell you for sure. This is just again the taste, the tidbits. You need to you know you should if if it's something that speaks to you, go there, follow the trail. What do you feel when you're standing there? It's well, some. Not, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. Not to interject here, but I do have a note on this. Kelpius was an astronomer, mm-hmm. and I don't, I don't know if this is the group you're talking about, but the Society of the Women in the Wilderness and the right. Monks, Th- that was, and, and then there's another one. Oh my gosh, the, the Monks of the Ridge. Is that who it is? 
It's the uh, no. There's a oh oh gosh. It's it's and, and and like I said, it's it's in the book, and I'm I, it's killing me that I'm not remembering the name, and now I'm flipping through to see the name because then it'll then well, it will. Like, we're not um, talking about the ancient and mystical order Rosicrucis, are we? No, it's uh oh gosh, it's the um. And you can go there now. You can go there and you can um you can actually see the uh what do you call it? You can you can all the buildings are preserved and you can you can walk around. Oh, damn it, I hate when this happens. Well hold on. I ha- I have to All right, now too. we're flipping through because yeah. I can't remember. And this is so funny because I just I I've spoken to someone about this before. Like people will ask me, like, well what's in the book, blah blah blah, and I like com- draw a complete blank blank. And do a deer in the headlights thing. And now it's killing me that I can't remember the name of this place. Oh, damn. Oh, it's like right on the next page. The Ephrata Cloister. Oh, there it is. <laughs> okay. Oh, my God. Oh, dear. It's because it's a Sunday and I'm, and I'm, I'm sick and blah, sorry, blah, blah. Sorry. So, yeah. So, after Kelpie has died, he had people go off. There were people that branched off and they went, like, I guess, further out. And you can actually go to this Ephrata cloister. The the buildings are still there and they've, they've, pres- they've actually preserved things, you know, to a greater extent. I mean, the cave is just like the cave. It's like this is, you know supposedly where he set up shop but this is where the followers ended up after and we have a very good idea of their lifestyle you know and how monastic they were and they you know and the uh, german calligraphy that they practiced and their chants and all that other kind of stuff yeah so there's a lot left to go through in my notes anyways and i don't want to keep you long here but yeah no we're good maybe let's try to maybe redirect and go to a top five places that you know i, I asked you this yesterday yeah my problem is when I read books in general that I'm going to talk to people about is I just make copious amounts of notes and I never get to all of them. <laughs> and I feel like now we're right in the middle of this book, you know, traveling through it. And I, I don't want to like have a three hour conversation because we could very easily, you know, yes. but the next place in the book is your home state. And I do want to cover that New Jersey. Yeah. What about your home state? Did you discover that you didn't know before? Okay. So the first thing that I would say that was the dis- the discovery thing that, and again, it's probable, alleged, that kind of thing. Um, but the idea that Aleister Crowley could possibly be buried in New Jersey is a little bit intriguing to me. Sure. And it certainly explains a lot. No, I'm just, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it explains a lot about New Jersey. But again, the, the story is it's alleged you're going by, you know, resources and words of of people in the past. And and is it accurate? Who knows? But the idea that he could possibly be buried in New Jersey or his, or some of his remains are in New Jersey, I think is really intriguing. What's the story behind that? Could you share it? So Crowley died in England and he was cremated. And this is where things get kind of it it's kind of gets a little bit sketchy supposedly his ashes were given into the care of Carl Germer who was his successor and by the way I want to preface this with uh, with I am certainly no scholar of Crow- Crowley's life I mean there are people that I mean books and books and books and 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 whatnot of who he was and what he did also the OTO no scholar of that either this is just information this is information I gleaned along the way from my own research and that's why i preface everything with allegedly so supposedly his ashes were given into the care of carl germer who was his successor and carl germer had a house in lebanon township which he called the white house no relation to the one in washington dc it was just a white farmhouse and one of two things happened he either buried the ashes at the base of a palm uh, uh, not palm tree excuse me a pine tree or his wife smashed the urn or receptacle with the ashes at the base of the pine tree. And there was an issue of OTO newsletter um, that were um, Grady McMurdy, another OTO person, went and visited Germer and Germer confessed that that's what happened to the ashes. And if that's true, if any of it's true, that means that Crowley's remains were buried, scattered, something in western new jersey so who knows 
yeah. would be cool if it was true. I think it would be cool. It would also be, depending on your view of Crowley, maybe kind of morbid and scary <laughs> or whatever. But that location, by the way, is on my top five sites to visit. If you could visit it, it's private, right? But yeah, it's it's a it's a from what I understand, it's a dairy farm, right? And it's on private property, and. Personally, I did not go knocking on doors to see if I could, you know, walk the land. <laughs> I, you know, I figure it's not that's not something that that I, I I don't know if I would I would go that far. Um, but that's why I suggested going to the nearby mountain and uh, doing a little something over there for him right. if you want to try to make that connection. And he was a mountaineer, so. Well, in my day, I talk like I'm 75. <laughs> I uh, I've hopped fences and walls and things that are private to experience things like this. So, in the oh, right yeah. in the right mood and moment, I would <laughs> invade this dairy farm to just get a glimpse of what may be Alistair Crowley's final resting place. So. <laughs> See, my fence hopping days, I mean, and it wasn't too long ago that I was fence hopping. I mean, the last fence hop that I did was my daughter, my daughter and I were in, went to, I we went to, we were in Paris and I was hell bent on making a rubbing of Jim Morrison's grave. All right. So we go to Père Lachaise, which I'm butchering yeah. the name and it's all fenced in and I'm like, but there was nobody there. And I'm like, you know, I could go in there and do this. And it was like, no, no, we we better not, you know, we better not do it. So we walked around and we did some other stuff. And then we came back. And when we came back, there were people there, like, you know, just like some, you know, random visitors. But there were like lit candles inside the, the little fenced in area. So someone was there. And I'm like, I could go in there and I could do this. And Mary was my, that's my daughter. She was like, I really don't want to go to a French prison. And I'm like, we're not going to go to French prison. And then I had people looking out and I made a whole bunch of rubbings until the guard came and threw us out. So that was my last, <laughs> that was my last fence hopping adventure. I don't know if I'm up for another one just yet. <laughs> well, if I ever get there and I'm in the mood, I'll give you a call. Sometimes all you need is a little peer pressure. You True. Know? So I just mentioned, though, that this potential final resting place of Crowley is is in my top five sites from this book. Let's cover the rest. And I'll I'll start with mine and then we'll get to yours. All right. If that's okay. okay. Yeah. So and these are in no particular order. These are just the five spots I pulled out that spoke to me personally. and, And there's reasons for them. The next one on my list is and it's not really one location, but it's the New York City Tarot Tour. Ooh, I'm so happy you said that one. <laughs> and I just was blown away by this because it's not like an actual tour. It's not something that you can pay to, to take. It seems like you just kind of figured this out along your way, or I'm not sure how you figured this out. How did you come across this particular series of sites, I guess? Or how did you pick out what they stood for in the tarot deck? I don't know. Just kind of summarize what it is and how you figured it out. Yeah, no, I, I totally made this one up and, and I didn't see it anywhere else. And I just thought, you know, that you got, the tarot is our archetypes. They're archetypal figures. And it was pretty easy to find statuary and artwork in public places that looked like the images on Pamela Coleman Smith's deck. You know, and I'm sure if I put my mind to it, I'd probably be able to do one for every single card. I'm sure we would be able to we would be able to find the imagery and it not necessarily. It was really that's what I was looking for was the visual like the statue of I think it's Mercury walking off the roof for the fool. And if I think about it, too, it's like I'm sure that there could be connotations between Mercury and the fool as well. And then some just were like, you know, naturals, like the library lions for strength, I think. I was kind of torn between making the Statue of Liberty the magician or the hermit. I think I I went back and forth with that for a bit. And then I found I found a replacement for one of them. I think my favorite, though, is that the upside down elephant for the hanged man. And and you know what? This is very interesting. I think one of the things I'm going to do is to pull it up on Google Maps. And make like a walking tour of it. I mean, it's big, but I think it is kind of walkable. If you're a walking kind of person, you could spend the whole day looking at these things. Yeah, and I, I love to walk. I would prefer to walk through cities than drive through them, obviously, or even Uber through them these days. I just much rather would 
Walk City box because I think that is how you experience the energy because these cities, mm-hmm. I think, especially as a, a place like New York, are very meticulously laid out. You know? Oh, yeah. So the New York City tarot tour, that really st- stuck out to me because, as you said, it's it's something that you just made up. And mm-hmm. I thought that was just really cool. It's the really, I think, the only feature from this book, the only site that you just completely constructed from scratch and just kind of made your own walking tour from. I thought that was really cool. Oh, thanks. No problem. So the next item on my list is the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library in New Haven, Connecticut. Obviously, this is where Yale University is located. But the interesting thing about this library is that it's home to the Voynich Manuscript. And this is something that if you've ever studied rare books, manuscripts, ciphers that you come across, it's something that I can't even talk to it much because I don't know much about it other than just what I've read on like Wikipedia and some online blogs but you went to this library you did you see the manuscript then no i didn't i think that it well you can see it online you can view the whole thing online right okay in order to see or to have access to some of these materials you either have to be a yale student or a professor or whatever or you register as a scholar with the library and then like you know, and then they give you access and you go downstairs to the reading room where they deliver the materials to you and then you can like access them there. So yeah, you have to you have to have a scholarly interest and register with the library and all that kind of stuff in order to actually view the the manuscript itself, but you can see the whole thing online. If you've ever have you ever seen The Ninth Gate, the film The Ninth Gate? Uh is that Johnny Depp? Yeah. Yeah, I think I saw that years ago. Okay, so he goes when he goes and gets the um, the, uh, the 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 ninth gate book, nine gates of the kingdom of shadows, whatever. Right. Frank Langella's character brings him up to his private library. That's what this place looks like. Okay. It's incredible. It's an amazing temple of books. I think we should explain what this <laughs> manuscript is and maybe what some oh, theories. The yeah, what some theories are behind it. Oh yeah, I mean it's. I don't think people. I, I, there is no definitive answer as to what it is. There's drawings of plants. I believe that there's also drawings of planet stars, that kind of thing in there. It's indecipherable. You know, people who've had their hands on it have never, you know, been able to, you know, is it a grimoire? Is it an encyclopedia? I don't know if it's like, if, if even like passages have been translated in it. I, I don't think so. Um, and there's also, it's, it's, it's questionable as is to whether it's complete or not as well. Yeah, and it's very old. It, it's carbon dated, I believe, back to around the 15th century. Yep. And then there were also I and I'm I'm if I'm remembering right, one of the things I said was that John D couldn't make it out. Yeah, yeah, you so did that, say that. Yeah. yeah. It's like well, what is this? So, you know, where it came from, what it did, and it's called Voynich because that was the either the last or the penultimate owner of it. That's who it was named after. Right. And then it landed in the Beinecke. But it's very cool that you can really that you can flip through the pages and see the whole thing and try to try to make something of it. Yeah, I know that the whole thing is online. I haven't looked at it because I don't have I haven't made time to look at it because that's one of those things like I don't know what your personality is like, but if I started to look at that thing, I'd look at it for weeks. Yeah. Yeah, I'd have to set aside like a whole month and be like, all right, I'm going to dig into this 240 page manuscript that nobody else in the history of the world has been <laughs> able to solve. And I'm going to solve this fucking thing. <laughs> oh, dear. Anyways, the next item on my top five is the Providence Athenium. Am I saying that right? Is it Athenaeum? I don't know. I don't know. Athenaeum. You say Athenaeum, I say Athenaeum. It's well, all the you, same to you've me. been there, so I'm assuming that you're pronouncing it right. I don't know. Athene- Athenaeum. Okay, whatever. However you said it. Yeah. But the reason I picked this out, because you noted that it's a favorite writing spot, or was a favorite writing spot, of both H.P. Lovecraft, who's obviously linked to Providence, but also Edgar Allan Poe, who I grew up loving. I've never met another 12-year-old who was more into Poe than I was. (laughs) I think that might be why I am the way I am now. But Poe and Lovecraft have been guides that I've read and, and studied academically for years now. So the fact that this little spot in Providence, Rhode Island, it was a favorite writing spot for both of them. And I didn't know Poe had ever even made it to Providence to do anything, to be honest. So that spoke to me personally. Oh, you know, have you have you read J.W. Ocker's book, Poland? No, I haven't. Okay, you need to go to, oh, there's a first, go to his blog, 
it's called Odd Things I've Seen. Amazing blog. Awesome blog. And he's written several books now. I think you would really enjoy them. I think he did one called The New York Grimpendium. I want to say that's one of the titles. He just did... Um, a book like where he, he lived in Salem for a month, for the month, like the Halloween month for all of October. And he wrote about like witches and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but he did a book called Poland and oh my gosh. Yeah. No, you would, you would like okay, it. I think. Okay. So J.W. Ocker, I haven't, I just pulled up his blog, Odd Things I've Seen. And I realize now I have his blog bookmarked. So <laughs> I've been here before. I've been here before, but I haven't, I guess I haven't dug too much into it yet, but that's interesting. Okay. Oh yeah. Poland. Yeah. Oh. Right there it is. The Hallowed Haunts of Edgar Allan Poe and the New York Grimpendium, A Guide mm-hmm. to Macabre and Ghastly Sights. So yep. similar to what, you know, you've written here probably. Yes and no. I mean, he, he delves deep. He is, like, I am a shallow pond. There you go. And <laughs> well, I don't mean that in a bad way, by the right. way. I yeah. mean, everything has its, you know, everything has its place. I personally, I mean, like, I like to delve deep myself. I don't necessarily like to write deep like that. I like giving the tastes and the tidbits and maybe it's because I, I have like a, an, an attention problem or something like that, but it's just like, Oh, here's a little bit here. Oh, this is really cool. Okay, well, we'll read more about that later. Oh, look at this. This is also very cool. Like, you know, one shiny object to the next. Yeah, so. and, you know, he may be able to answer my question about the Salem Witch Trials. He wrote a whole book about it. So Exactly, see? There we go. So, okay, let's go back to... Let's see, hold on. I need to change my window here. Okay, so the next site on my list in my top five... Okay, so let's just recap. I've given the Crowley Potential Burial Site, the New York City Tarot Tour, the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library, and the Providence, however you want to say this, yep. Athenaeum. So that's four. My last one is very personal to me because if you caught me from age 19 to about 23, so like, you know, my college years, I guess, yep. and you asked me, so I majored in creative writing, by the way. Oh, cool. So if you asked me, hey, Who's your favorite writer from those ages? I would have told you Jack Kerouac. Okay. So his gravesite at Edson Cemetery in Lowell, Massachusetts, his hometown, makes my list for nostalgic purposes. I don't know if I'm as big a fan of Kerouac now as I was back then, but just like I said, for nostalgia, I just want to go and stare at that gravesite for a few minutes and just kind of admire it. I've always been drawn to cemeteries anyways, so I, I, I figure a cemetery has to make my top five here and... I picked out Kerouac's grave just because, you know, from those ages in my college years, my favorite writer. And there's something about cemeteries. And then, you know, if you have someone to whom you're drawn, you know, going to the grave site is is definitely in of itself. It's like a little spiritual journey. (laughs) Look what I went through for Jim Morrison. Oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) But I did the same for Tolkien. I was very happy that I got out there. Where's he buried at? Oxford. Okay. Yeah. So he's um he's out that way. And when I went, I have a friend that I, I visit out there and I was like, please, can we go to, we're going to go to, Tol- can we go to Tolkien's grave? Um, and it's very modest, very inconspicuous, but it was, it was, it was good to be there. I know. I, I, I totally, totally get that. So you gave me a list of sites before we spoke that you liked your own personal top five. And <laughs> I'm glad to say that they are completely different than mine. <laughs> <laughs> Except for maybe the site in Providence that I named about the writing spot of Lovecraft, because you you do mention that looking for H.P. Lovecraft in Providence, just in yeah. general, the whole city is probably in your top five, right? Yeah, I mean that's I like I said I cheated on some of them because it was like like New York City. Um, there's a lot you can crush in together there because there's there's many many sites in New York and Providence. There's a whole tour that you can do of different sites that where Lovecraft um, spent his time. I would say one of my favorites was a cemetery. It's the cemetery next to the church where he used to just kind of wander around and contemplate and whatnot. The church, by the way, as far as I know, and I think the plans are still slated the same. It is going to be a a museum and a center for the slave trade up north. Remember, we we're talking about like hoodoo practice and all that other kind of stuff, yeah. you know, and even though, you know, at Civil War, post-Civil War, the north was, quote, like safer for African-American folks, there was still shady business going on. 
Um, and the museum is going to be, um, kind of a bridge building to kind of, uh, you know, show, yes, this was happening at this time and it was happening here. We could put some closure to it and move forward. So that's, yeah, that's, that's one of the sites that's associated with Lovecraft, but it's funny how it evolves, you know, it was the church, the churchyard, and now it's going to be this museum. Right. So another site in your top five, you mentioned the fairy chair in Maryland. What was that? Okay, first of all, I have to say I'm so glad that you wrote this down. <laughs> yeah. I don't have to remember. I mean, I would remember, but, you know, it's like I said, my mind and all that other kind of stuff. Okay, so right outside of D.C., because Maryland and D.C. Are, are, are quite close. So we're talking, like, with no traffic, about 15 minutes from the Capitol. There's this cemetery where it's a cedar something. Let me see if I can get the name. Cedar Hill Cemetery in a town called Sweetland in Maryland. It's about, like I said, about 15, 20 minutes with no traffic outside of D.C. In the 19, I think, 30s or 40s, the folks who owned the cemetery uh, had hired this man, um, Denicio Rodriguez, to beautify the area with some of his sculptures. And he worked in a medium called, and here we go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to totally butcher this, Fa Bois which I think means false wood. And I, I know I probably butchered it, but it's, it's, it's false wood. He basically worked in cement with his own secret formula for color. And he would make cement look like wood, like tree logs. Like another one is a little, um, it's like a tree shelter, like a hollowed out tree and there's benches inside. And another is this chair and it's the, it's the Annie Laurie wishing chair. The chair is, is modeled on an original from Scotland. It's like two seats together. And when you sit in it, there's a plaque in front of you. And basically what happens is you, you sit there with your true love, right? And you hold hands and you read the poem and then your relationship will be blessed by the fairies. Now, when I went there, I went by myself. (laughs) (laughs) So I sat in the chair and held my own hand and read the poem. (laughs) Well, hey, I don't think that that's a bad thing because (laughs) your true love should be yourself, I think. Oh, that's good. I like that. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know if you've heard this show before, but I have like a little uh, motto that I sign off with every show, and it's love yourself, think for yourself, question authority. Yeah. So to me, loving yourself is very important. Oh, yeah. I mean, like the the whole thing was, I mean, like that was the day that I went like I went around manically taking photos because that was the other thing, I'm, you know, and hopefully if I get to do the rest of the series, the next one will be West. Um, I'll have more time to collect pictures. People graciously donated photos for me, um, but I had to run around and take a bunch myself. And that was one of the days where I just like was running around taking pictures and I just kind of bopped around from site to site to site. And when I finally found this chair and I was sitting there and it was just the beginnings of spring and there were azaleas blooming and I was like, I'm not just going to take a picture of this chair. I'm going to sit in this chair. And as I was sitting there, I'm like, no, I, I totally agree with you because yeah, you really, I, I mean, I guess like that you can't, but it's, it's, it's more difficult to have relationships with other people if you don't accept yourself first. So yes, I believe, I, I agree with you totally. Self-love is very important and it's, it's, it's neither pathetic nor arrogant. You know, it's, it's accepting yourself for who you are. So, right. So you've mentioned, okay, the Lovecraftian Providence, the fairy chair in Maryland, also on your list, which we've already talked about, was the idea that Crowley might be buried in New Jersey. Yeah. You mentioned New York City as a whole. Right. I don't know if there's anything specifically about New York that you want to talk about, but go for it. Well, I'm glad you that you that that you really like that tarot tour because that was like you said. I think that w- that really was the only thing in the book that I like. Where it was a where it was a tour for one, and that I kind of pieced it together, like and curated it. But I'm gonna I'm gonna change something if that's okay with you. Oh, um, damn it, Natalie! Why would you do that? Sorry, you no, lied okay. to me before, so I figured. <laughs> oh yeah, even that's now. true. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of skip over New York and go into Connecticut and go to the Gillette Castle State Park. Oh, yeah. Where there's that gallery of Pamela Coleman Smith art. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's imp- – it was – for me, I've been reading cards, tarot cards – probably since I was like seven, 17, not professionally, but I've, you know, I've been playing with them and, and, you know, and working with them and whatnot. And to see 
originals of her artwork, even if it wasn't the tarot, was an incredibly wonderful experience. Because seeing the artwork and seeing the colors that she chose, it's different than what you see like on the cards, right? I have a couple of books that where she um, did the illustrations. They're just, they're, they're muted and wonderful. And, and they could just be like, like sketches and, and things for costumes. Cause that's what, what all of the, the pieces in that museum are because William Gillette was her cousin. Um, and he brought Sherlock Holmes to the stage. She was the set designer and costume designer for his productions, but you could see the, con- you can see the connection. There's this one really great picture of Sherlock kind of lounging, on the floor with this robe and it's so reminiscent of the empress if you take a look at the card um one of these days i'm gonna have to do a blog post where i like pop the two of them up together i just don't know it's a really interesting juxtaposition so yeah that that would definitely be a favorite site is is the gillette castle state park and that gallery of her artwork and so your last item on the list then you have a tie but i'm gonna break this tie for you but you okay you put dog mountain or the earth clock both in vermont but I want you to talk about the Earth Clock, if you could. The Earth Clock is special, and especially is special now for a number of reasons. I love that site because it's new, but because also it's so very ancient. It's based on, um, its construction is based on ancient principles. And I was really fortunate that when I went up there, I met the man who built it. His name was Ivan Macbeth. He also did the contribution for Vermont. In again, he was another very graciously when I asked him and, and I had just met him that day and I was like, Hey, would you do this? And he was like, Oh, sure. You know, no worries. And, and, you know, he got me this lovely ritual that they do. I believe at the, uh, at the summer solstice, you know, he showed me the different stones and, and the different, the different significance for, for each one. Um, we talked about where they came from and whatnot. They were all, all the stone was donated from uh, the uh, rock of ages quarry in Vermont. There's just the whole project it, itself. It's like this uh, organization, Circles for Peace. What their goal is, is to have a park like that in every state, which I think would be marvelous. And they, it's these, like, this, this stone circle that like people could just go in. I mean, like when we were there, there were like kids darting in and out among the stones and whatnot. They might not have known like like the different significances of them, but the fact that they're there, you know, and that you could always go there. And there's like a there's a sundial in the middle. If you go to the website, it'll tell you all the like the, the bits and pieces about it. But like I said, it's it's especially special because Ivan passed away on the autumnal equinox of 2016. 2016 was a was a really wacky rough year. I know we lost a lot of celebrities and there was a lot of turmoil. God knows. I personally had a lost family members and my mentor last year. And when Ivan passed away, that was just like, and he never got to see the book. Like it happened. He, he it, the book came out October eighth, and I hadn't gotten my copies yet, and I needed, to, I wanted to send him one, but he never got to see it. But I know, I know he was happy with it, and and, and it was just like I said, it's a, it's a, it's a special place. It's a special place because you know, even though we had, there's like places in the world like Stonehenge, now they're protected because there are archaeological sites. Here's a place where you can go and experience that and touch things and hang all over them and and just like hang out in, in this in the center of these stones whenever you want. Well, within park hours, of course, but you know what I mean. Right. Just to recap, then my top five was the Crowley burial site with an asterisk, you know, because we don't know if it was actually there or not, but. Just for shits and giggles, right? Yeah. <laughs> the Crowley Burial Site, the New York City Tarot Tour, the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library, the Providence... Oh, how do we say this word again? The Providence... The, that, that library in Providence. Yeah, that, 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 one, <laughs> that one library in Providence that has the word Athena and then an E-U-M at the end of it. How about that? That's and good. Then, Love it. Perfect. And then Kerouac's <laughs> Grave Site. And your top five, also the Crowley Burial Site with an asterisk... The Fairy Chair in Maryland, uh, Searching for Lovecraft in Providence, uh, The Earth Clock in Vermont, which you just talked about, and then the Gillette Castle State Park in Connecticut. So for people that want to visit our personal top fives, there they are. Uh, but I would encourage people to pick up the book and make their own list of places they'd love to, to see that, that speak to them, obviously. Some other things that are in here, by the way, that I just want to point out, kind of like an honorable mention for my own list, the Houdini grave site. I've been a fan of, of Houdini for a long time. I know it's a different sort of magic than maybe what we would talk about on this podcast, but Houdini was just, I don't know, he was, he was such a such a compelling and, 
I don't know, he, he kind of was responsible for bringing that sort of magic into pop culture, right? Yeah, and I mean, he also had an, a, a, an interest in the spiritual. He wanted right. to believe. Yeah. I mean, I know that he had a lot, he, he exposed a lot of frauds, you know, or who he, be, people he believed to be frauds, but it was all in an effort to prove that there is something beyond this life. You know, and like I said, he desperately wanted to believe that, I think. Now, there's a, what do you call it? There's, there's still the guy, I think, that still tries to contact him every year. I, he picked up where Beth left off. After Houdini died, he made, he, I guess, like had a, a an agreement with his wife that she would try to contact. And then he would, there was like some sort of secret code that he would say to her or whatever the message was. And according to Bess, never happened. And there's a man who, there was an NPR interview with him where, and, and, and the man was in his 90s. I think he's still around and, and he's done it for decades. He's he's done the same thing, but hasn't had anything. But I got to wonder, and I, I think I said this in the book too, it's like a magician never reveals his secrets. Would, if, let's say Bess did, con- he did contact Bess. Maybe they kept it between them. Possibly. That's what I mean. It's all, everything was in, is in the realm of possibility. Yeah, why, why would Houdini's wife reveal that he was exactly. contacting her <laughs> it would make no sense just knowing the guy and knowing what he was into and and how he went about his own business so i have one more thing that i want to talk to you about sure. and it's it's more of like a story that i want to tell you if that's okay yeah sure so since you're the first witch that i've talked to and i'm not talking about just for this podcast i'm talking about in my life really i had one other interaction with a girl who self-identified as a Wiccan. Okay. But she plays a very minor role in this. So let's just go back. When I was in high school, I grew up in a small town in Northwest Ohio. And about, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes outside of the town, there was this urban legend. It was a location called Coffin Road. (laughs) I know, it's a very, very corny (laughs) name. But the legend surrounded... There was an orphanage on this road that burned to the ground with all the kids and the caretaker inside. Oh, God. (laughs) Yeah, so the site is marked with just like kind of like a mass gravestone. And it has all the names of the kids on it and the adults that were in the house as well when this happened. Nobody knows, I think, exactly how the fire started. Nobody knows if it was arson or not or whatever, but... There was a lot of people, a lot of kids, you know, maybe 10 or 12 kids and one or two adults that died in this this house fire. Okay. And I don't know when exactly it was, but it was a long time ago, you know, maybe 1800s or so probably. So this site is kind of locally famous, you know, and, and kids will go out there on the weekends and just hang out, maybe party a little bit. When I was in high school, a lot of people were going out there and I don't want to say they were like desecrating the site, but they were doing some weird shit out there. What do you mean by desecrate? They would like piss on the gravestone, for example. I hope the people that did that got what they deserved. But that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. You know, right. some other people, you know, you just go out and you just drink some beers out there or whatever and, and just kind of hang out. But I went out there one night and it was around Halloween. It wasn't on Halloween, but it was in October. It was the fall. It was after a high school football game. Right. And I had piled about six or seven kids into my car and we drove out there. And we were just hanging out, you know, kind of wandering around, trying to to get the vibe, right? Right. And nothing happened, you know, but we got, so so we got in my car after like an hour and we just went home. The next morning, I had to wake up early for something and I go outside and it's foggy, right? And, you know, my windows are all fogged up and everything. And I get in my car to like defrost it. And Natalie, there were three symbols etched into my windows when I turned on my car and tried to unfog it. And there were two on my driver's side window, and there was one in the windshield, like up above where you would sit on the driver's side. And they were all the same. What was it? It was the Celtic cross. Okay. Or at least it was a version of the Celtic cross, like a sun cross, too. I guess it's kind of like the same, same symbol, right? All right, so yeah, no, I mean you're talking like either an equilateral or a a um, a cross with a longer a longer um, blah, 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 excuse me um, horizontal line with the circle around the the intersection part. Yeah, yeah I mean well, the the cross was inside the circle. Do you know what the ethnicity of the of any 
were, was it if it was an orphanage did they have do you know anything about the ethnicity of the people who ran it no, about no mm-hmm. no i don't all right because that was that when you said that and i was like okay well my first thing would always be okay when you say etched and it's defogging you mean like someone did it with their finger no or did someone no, scratch it into the glass that's what i have to explain it wasn't scratched into the glass it wasn't drawn on with a finger it was just in the glass. And every time my car would fog up, I would see them. I couldn't see them when the car was, like, when the windows were just normal. But every time there was condensation, I would see them. Two on the driver's side window, one on the windshield. And it was like this until I got rid of that car. Those crosses never disappeared. Here's the thing. I was actually asked, I went to, to dinner with um, my cousins last week and, you know, I, I, I sent them a copy of the book or whatnot. And they were like, do you really believe these things? And I'm like, yes, I do really believe these things, but I always have a skeptic side. So I would always ask, oh, do you, did you, do you remember one of your friends doing something or whatever? And if you don't, and if it doesn't sound like this is something that if it's just, if it's in, you know, if it was in there and it wasn't there before, that would be my first question. Do you know the ethnicity of anyone who died there? No. You know, I mean, I, that would be I wish something I did, that, yeah, but I don't. Yeah, that would be something that I would look up and ta- take a look at the names and are any of Gaelic descent. The Wiccan girl that I mentioned comes into play because, you know, right. fast forward, that was in high school. In college, right. I'm in a, a creative writing class and I walk into class one day and I would not always sit beside her, but she was just, um, I hate to say this because it's like a stereotype, but when... When you would look at her, you would say, okay, yeah, that girl's a witch, you know? <laughs> if you'd sketched out what a witch looked like, it would be this girl. Okay. <laughs> I mean, and I'm just talking about from a 20-year-old's interpretation of it, just black hair, black eye shadow, you know, she was shopping a Hot Topic, that kind of girl. Not necessarily gothic, because she wasn't a right. goth. So anyway, so I walk into class one day, and I would sit beside her every now and then. So I sit beside her on this day. And I noticed she's sketching a drawing in a book, and it's the same cross. Okay. And I'm still driving this car, by the way, at this point. So I just automatically, I'm like, okay, wait a minute. This is weird. I never talked to her about this kind of stuff before, but I'm just like, hey, I see you're drawing this cross right now. When class is over, would you mind? <laughs> I hated to say this because I didn't know like what she would think, but I was like, would you mind walking to my car with me? I'd like to show you something. So she thankfully was pretty cool about it. So we go to my car after class and I show her this stuff and I had to like fog up my own windows just to show her, right? Right. So she's like, wow, like, that's really fucking cool. And I was like, yeah, but what does it mean? And and so she's like, give me, you know, like a day or two. Like next time we're in class, I'll, I'll bring something for you. The only thing that she brought to me was just some basic internet searching that I could have done, right? But she, she did have a nugget in there that when this cross would appear in a series of three, that it, it was like a magical sort of sigil for protection. Hmm. Again, I haven't researched what the what what different symbols and whatnot mean, especially like in in groups of you know whatever. I mean, like you could look at groups of five could be protective. There's all sorts of magical numbers that could be at play there, but it doesn't sound also like you had a bad experience. You no, know what I mean? Yeah, not at all. That it wasn't that it wasn't a bad experience. And who knows? Maybe someone did reach over from the other side and was like, okay, this guy's okay, you know, and, and maybe needs to know that we're here. Well, that's kind of been the theme of my life, yeah. especially since that moment. I have noticed that um, spiritual protection has always been part of my life. I've never asked for it, if that makes sense. People have always told me that it's around me. Hey, protection's a great thing, you know, and if you have now, personally, I'm one of those people who is pretty much Psy dead, meaning that it takes a lot for me to feel, see, whatever, anything. But I've been told that on several occasions that I have a lot of help from the other side. Right. A lot of help, a lot of support, and a lot of it. You know what? I'll take it. You know, and it's the same thing. The thing is, if you are receptive to it and also can perceive it, that's a gift. And I think, you know, that's that, that, that's something to be, you know, developed or what's another word I'm looking for? Not just developed, but like just, you know, continue to be open to it. Right. I guess, you know, I guess is what I'm what I'm saying. But it's a gift, you know, and one doesn't you don't always ask for gifts, you know. But yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, the best gifts are the ones you don't ask for. Right. Exactly. 
Okay, so Natalie, it's been really fun talking to you. I really, I really enjoyed uh, Magical Destinations of the Northeast. I know you have some other things coming up, and you're also doing some other projects that go beyond books. Where can people, if they want more Natalie Zaman, where can they find you online? Where can they listen to you? Because you have a podcast out now, I believe. Yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a co-host at the Athena Zone now. It's, it's a little, it's a it's podcast or a radio show. I did an interview with Janet when the book first came out and then she needed a new co-host and asked me to try it. And it was something, it's so funny because it's it's funny how like things happen just to kind of piggyback off your story, you know, and how connections are made. Once I had started doing like different promotional stuff for the book, because you kind of have to do that kind of thing. I had been told by several people, you know, you really should do like a podcast or a vlog or or something like that. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another thing I have to learn how to do. And I, you know, time is, you know, not on my side as it is. You know, I I can't add another thing to the pile. So when this came up, I was like, well, you know, the interview went really well. I was like, sure, let's try it. Why not? So that's the Athena zone. And we're doing different, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of along the same lines. We don't specifically do just like, you know, occult things. But I think one of the things that we're talking about now, we just scheduled a couple of shows like shows is, you know, the wisdom in cartoons, which I love. And I think we're going to do something for Valentine's Day and maybe something for Year of the Rooster. So those are the few um, little shows coming up and that you could find on Facebook if you just search Athena Zone. And as for me, I could be found at nataliezaman.blogspot.com. And if you put nataliezaman.com, it just forwards all to the same place. So that's my website. Oh, one thing I do want to say is that like, if you, you know, one of the things we talked about and during the course of our conversation was that my book is a lot of tidbits and that's really what I, what I love to do. And there's a lot of scholarship behind that. And there are people that, that are the, the deep lakes that, that, that delve very deeply. Um, and if you go on my website, there's a page for Magical Destinations of the Northeast, and there is an extensive bibliography because I only got to put a um, an abridged bibliography in the actual book. But the full is on my website, including active links and everything else. You know, So if you find a place that interests you, read more about it and look at my resources because these folks really have, you know, they've done their homework. They've delved deep. Some of it is just theories and whatnot, but it's just fascinating to just kind of, you know, explore more while we're here still i have one more question for you yeah. and it's the most serious one that i'm gonna ask you oh dear <laughs> <laughs> and you don't have to answer it right now that's the best part about it but oh good okay <laughs> i am looking for a resident witch for this podcast and you've definitely proven yourself worthy of this honor so i am offering you that position as witch in residence here at old culture it's unpaid Okay. But what I lack, but what I lack in funding, I make up for in fun. So <laughs> if you're interested, let me know. But I need a go-to witch to just have conversations with. So if you're interested, get with me offline or I guess okay. online since we talked on Facebook. But whatever. Oh, exciting! Awesome. I don't want to cut into your podcast. I don't want to cut into your writing. But there's just somebody that I'll I'll need to talk about witchy things with from time to time, and I'd love for that person to be you. Oh, thank you so much. Yes. And I mean, like, it's, you know, usually when you get one, you have a whole network behind you. Because if there's something, say, like, say you ask something, and it's like, I really have no idea. I probably know someone that does, or that can have an idea. I I love connecting folks together. I think that's, that's, that's awesome. Yay. I was say, I'd love to. I'd love to come back on and talk about other stuff like that. I I bookmarked that that uh, article on digital um, digital magic and digital witchcraft and whatnot. It's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, we didn't get to that today, but so maybe that's a little teaser for our next conversation. Digital witchcraft sounds really sexy. Right? <laughs> All right. So Natalie Zaman, thank you so much for being here. Good luck. You've been so much fun to talk to, and I really appreciate your time. Ooh, thanks for having me. And back at you. This is awesome. All right, there you have it. My thanks again to the wandering witch, Natalie Zaman. Again, check her out at nataliezaman.blogspot.com and pick up her book, Magical Destinations of the Northeast, if you want a travel companion for your next adventure. Both those are linked in the show notes if you're interested. I don't have any great insights to add to this chat. Not that I have great insights to add to any chat. But I will say... 
that this is probably the most comfortable that I've felt with a guest to this point, and I have to thank Natalie for that. I thought she brought a unique energy to the conversation, just a great, positive, lighthearted energy. Don't underestimate how important that type of energy is in your relationships with other people and in your relationship with yourself. And for the record, Natalie messaged me damn near immediately after we got off our call and accepted my offer to be O'Culture's witch in residence, which pleases me to no end. I love having a witch on speed dial. And I'm already looking forward to chatting with her again. We'll definitely tackle that digital witchcraft topic and who knows what else. Anyway, that does it for this one. Thank you for choosing to spend your time here with us. If you want to hang out with us online, check us out on social media. The major networks we're most active on are Twitter at OculturePod and Instagram at Oculture underscore podcast. We're also on Facebook, just search Oculture Podcast. We're also on Tumblr and Pinterest, and I'm trying to figure out a Snapchat strategy. We're on there now, username OculturePod, and we'll crank that up to 11 here pretty soon. All of those profiles are linked in the show notes. And if the mood strikes you, drop the show a good rating on iTunes or email me at oculturepodcast at gmail.com with any sort of feedback you may have. Or if you want to book a cross-country occult-themed road trip, I am down. I am also Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, question authority, and please don't eat at a fucking Applebee's. Please rewind this cassette.